Welcome to Not Your Ordinary Parts, a podcast where we talk about hard things associated with the human experience with the goal of increasing awareness, growth, and healing. You may hear information from professionally licensed therapists, life coaches, healers, doctors, etc. This information is not medical advice or therapy and is not meant to replace actual therapy or instructions given by a doctor or a personal therapist. I'm your host, Jalon Johnson. My guest today is Angie Alt. Angie is co-found, Angie co-founded Autoimmune Wellness. She's a certified AIP coach and author of the Alternative Autoimmune Cookbook. Angie spent a decade helping others take charge of their health the same way she took charge of her own health after suffering with celiac disease, endometriosis, and lichen sclerosis. Sclerosis, oof, a little tongue twister there. <laughs> One nutrition step at a time. Although passionate about autoimmune wellness, Angie recently stepped away from that work last November to focus on community care activism in her new space, Notes from a Neighbor. So Angie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being my guest. Well, thanks so much for having me, Angela. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I gave a bit of an introduction about what you do and who you are, but just so that the audience can get to know you a little bit better, um, would you mind telling us a little bit about your story and how you got to who and where you are today? And try and pronounce some of those words right that I got wrong. <laughs> no, you did You did a great job. Those are, those are hard <laughs> ones to pronounce. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Angie Alt. Um, I have three autoimmune diseases. Uh, I have lichen sclerosis. Um, a lot of folks know it as LS, um, which is an autoimmune skin condition. I have endometriosis and I have celiac disease. Um, I kind of got pretty rapidly ill over the course of about a decade. Um, that kind of culminated while uh, my family and I were living in West Africa for my husband's work. Um, he works in international development. So we were living in Guinea and Sierra Leone uh, at the time. And, you know, there's very limited uh healthcare in, in those countries. And we didn't know my, my uh, celiac disease was still undiagnosed at that time. So we didn't know what we were dealing with. And um, I ended up going through three medical evacuations to try to get help for what seemed to be going on. And of course, because I was in West Africa, it was often assumed that I might have some kind of tropical disease like malaria. Um, and finally, after the third evacuation, I told my husband, I got to go home. I got to concentrate, honey, and try to figure out what is happening. And um, probably about six months or so after I, I came home um, in 2012, um, I was diagnosed with celiac disease. Um, and the treatment for celiac disease is a gluten-free diet, um, which I immediately adopted, but I was so malnourished and kind of debilitated by that point that just um, the regular gluten-free diet wasn't really enough for me. And I started learning about something which was brand new at the time, um, a dietary template called the Automy Protocol or AIP. And so I jumped headfirst into that and started trying to work on nutrition and lifestyle aspects on my own. Um, and it worked very well. Um, within the first six weeks, my gluten antibodies dropped by half. Um, previously on just a gluten-free diet alone, my celiac antibodies weren't really moving. Um, by about six months, it was like I had a new body. <laughs> um, and by one year, I decided to change every aspect of my life, including my career, to focus on helping other people learn about the autoimmune protocol and adopt it as an autoimmune uh, disease management tool themselves. Um, I became a certified health coach and a nutritional therapist. Um, I eventually partnered with Mickey Truscott at Autoimmune Wellness. Um, we wrote a book together. I wrote a book on my own. We ran a podcast for a long time. Uh, we eventually um, started a course called AIP Certified Coach to certify other coaches to work with folks um, with autoimmune disease. And I ran my own coaching program. And then um, I guess, you know, that was about 10 years of work, uh, a decade of work. 
Um, and then last fall, um, I had transitioned into community care activism full time so that I could concentrate on kind of moving that conversation further upstream um, and looking at the root causes that are making us collectively, all of us, um, not as healthy as we could be and really harming our well-being. Well, thank you for that. That was um, very detailed and I think gave a, a pretty good picture of, of who you are. Um, just so that if someone is listening and they may, you know, not know, not necessarily know what autoimmunity is, or maybe they're just getting into the, the auto, autoimmune world. Um, can you define or describe what autoimmunity is and what some of the symptoms are? Yeah. So like in very simple terms, autoimmune disease happens when our immune systems mistakenly identify our own cells as foreign invaders and attack them. It's kind of like a battlefield scenario where something has gone wrong and our own troops start to fire on us. Um, it's like the immune system is producing antibodies against our own tissue. And unfortunately, when the body learns how to do that, it can't unlearn it, meaning autoimmune disease can be well managed, but it cannot be cured. Um, the conditions that are associated with autoimmune disease affect organs or certain systems of the bodies um, that are targeted by, by this like mistaken self-attack. So for instance, um, Hashimoto's disease is when our bodies attack our thyroid. Um, celiac disease, which I have, is when our bodies attack the small intestine and our ability to absorb nutrients. Um, rheumatoid arthritis is the body attacking the joints. Um, type 1 diabetes is like, you know, the, the body mistakenly attacking the pancreas. Um, there's over a hundred different um, autoimmune conditions. And then there's, um, there's also many conditions that aren't autoimmune, but they often show up in conjunction with autoimmune disease. Um, you might think about things like Lyme disease, for instance. Um, and then there's conditions that we're not a hundred percent sure they're autoimmune yet, but there's like a lot of mounting evidence. For instance, endometriosis is becoming one of those diseases that it's pretty clear there's an immune system dysregulation problem happening. The other thing that's important to know about autoimmune disease is that our genetics, um, are a factor, but just because you have a gene doesn't mean you will automatically develop that autoimmune disease. Our, it's kind of like our uh, genetics are loading the gun, but our environment is pulling the trigger. So something happens that kind of turns on that autoimmune gene and starts that process. Um, it's different for every individual, but for instance, um, a really common underlier for a lot of people is some kind of viral infection. So um, that that definitely gave some insight on what autoimmunity is. Um, now, something that I read when I was putting together the outline for this interview was that you grew up in Montana. And I wanted to ask if because you said autoimmunity, there is a gene there and something triggers it. Right. So do you think that growing up in Montana and your ability to have real food um, kind of kept your autoimmunity at bay? Yeah, for sure. So um, just to give context um, for your audience, all of Montana is not like some um, rural place where people are like living on a, a farm and riding horses. <laughs> <laughs> but but I did grow up very, very rural and kind of homestead style. Um, we had a, a very enormous garden, like a one acre size garden. Um, my dad, you know, hunted and fished. And so I had a lot of homegrown vegetables and fruits and, um, you know, natural organic meats. Uh, we lived close to a farmer um, and had like fresh dairy um, all the time. So I was really, um, I was really lucky to get to have that kind of food. It was really unprocessed. My mom was, you know, home making all the food. My grandma was canning all the vegetables. Like that was really um, special. And I lived that way through my early childhood. And then um, even up until about the time that I was 13, um, even then we were eating a mostly, you know, homemade unprocessed diet. And I think that it, um, 
really protected and, and kind of buffered my immune system from possibly triggering those autoimmune genes. And, and it was really beneficial for my microbiome and, and anyone in your audience who knows anything um, about um, autoimmunity and chronic illness in general is that the, the microbiome is often disrupted. So I think I really benefited from it in that way too. I'm sure I probably would have developed autoimmune disease sooner than my early adulthood if I had not had that beginning. That's exactly what I was thinking because you had access to those real whole foods and the nutrition that you were able to, you know, ingest, I'm sure played a big factor in keeping your autoimmunity at bay. Yeah, totally. What were some of the first signs of your autoimmunity and what did they look like? Um, you know, so, uh, really commonly for women, autoimmune disease can develop at certain points in our life where we have big hormonal transitions. That's a point in a woman's life when she's really vulnerable, vulnerable to the development of autoimmune disease. So you would think about puberty, uh, pregnancy and childbirth, and then again at menopause. Um, and after my daughter was born, I had my daughter when I was 21. After she was born, I started to develop the first symptoms and it started out with digestive discomfort. It was nothing very, very dramatic. Um, you know, folks who suffer from in, um, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's or ulcerative col colitis, they have pretty severe digestive trouble that starts right away. It wasn't like that for me. It was a little more mild. And when I went to see my doctors, I got it dismissed right away. They said, oh, it's just IBS. You'll be fine. Um, and that's really, that's a very common early misdiagnosis of celiac disease is IBS. So it kind of started out that way. Um, and then I started to experience some skin changes and that was the first signs of lichen sclerosis. And it's funny, Jalan, back in those days, that was before we had Dr. Google, right? <laughs> um, the, the WebMD didn't really exist like it does now. So I actually used a medical encyclopedia to look up my, my symptoms. And I was like, Oh, I think, I think I have this thing. And I, I went and saw my doctor. Um, and he was like, yeah, you're right you do, you have lichen sclerosis and he diagnosed me. And that was pretty lucky because most people with autoimmune disease go for years before they get a diagnosis. So I was lucky to get that first diagnosis so quickly. But one thing my doctor neglected to tell me, and that was an important piece of information is that once you have developed one autoimmune disease, um, it's not very hard for your body to kind of continue that self-attack process and you are at risk for developing further diseases. So, um, you know, I went on to develop celiac disease and endometriosis as well. Um, I think for you to be able to use a, a medical encyclopedia, you say? Yes. And, <laughs> that's and a, get that's it how right. old I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, yeah. okay, so for you to be able to use that, present that evidence to your doctor and then for him to agree or him or her to agree, I think that is pretty big because most people, they have symptoms and then they go to their doctor and a lot of times they're dismissed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and because you were able to do that, I think that maybe got you on your healing journey a lot sooner than it could have been if, you know, he would have just been like, ah, you know, it's this or it's that, or the symptoms are all in your head. Yeah. I mean, it is really, really common. I was, I was lucky with that first diagnosis to have that information and backing to kind of advocate for myself. Um, unfortunately the next two diagnoses took, you know, over a decade. Um, I, I was really, really sick before the doctors recognized what was happening in the other two cases. Mm, I'm sorry about that. I know that dealing with these symptoms can be very stressful. It can get you down. Was there a mental and emotional component to having the conditions that you have and being diagnosed? Yeah, definitely. I, I think any anybody with autoimmune disease in your audience will will recognize that and understand it. Um, I mean, first of all, for me, a big a big part of this is um, 
you know, over time, celiac disease that's unrecognized and untreated, it damages the small intestine. And the small intestine is where we primarily absorb the nutrients from our food. It's where we get the vitamins and minerals, you know, from our foods. Um, And the longer I went with having that untreated, the more malnourished I was getting. And I don't think we think about our emotional and mental health um, also having a basis stability in getting those, those vitamins and minerals, but it is a big player. Um, And the, you know, about a decade in um, I was having increasing trouble with that. You know, um, I, I can remember having some incidents like, for instance, where I would have a gluten exposure, which was daily at the time because I didn't know. And I would have these angry outbursts at my husband and I would even feel kind of like outside of myself watching this and be like, why am I getting so upset with him? Why am I so like kind of unreasonable? Like I couldn't quite control my emotions. And now in hindsight, I realized that a lot of that was, was to do with the kind of advancing disease. The other part of this, which again, folks in your audience with autoimmune disease will really relate to this is that my mental and emotional health was suffering because I was going through so much medical gaslighting and there was a lot of trauma and invalidation associated with that. You know, the sicker I was getting and the more desperately I was looking for help and the more often I was being told there's nothing wrong. The, the, the more I thought like, well, am I, am I having a mental breakdown? Like what is, what is going on here? Um, And there's also grief, you know, um, I was mourning the loss of my former healthy self. Um, and even after I got a diagnosis, there was some struggle there. You know, I had to adjust to a a new life and a new me that included, um, dealing with these chronic diseases. I'm so glad you mentioned the grief, um, and the, the emotional component because, Those are huge and being gaslit by doctors, right? Because I think that, and it's not that it's intentional, but a lot of doctors aren't trained in anything outside of just, um, you know, if something isn't within the parameters of what blood work says or take this medication. If you come in and you're knowledgeable, that could be a threat as well. Um, So there's so many other factors that play a part in our health when dealing with these conditions. So I'm glad you mentioned those. Yeah. Yeah. Common experience, unfortunately. (laughs) Right. You have some misdiagnoses too, right? Um, Even CPTSD or PTSD. Um, Mm -hmm. What was that like? Yeah. Wow. The misdiagnosis journey. I mean, again, anyone in your audience with autoimmune disease is just going to totally relate to this. You know, it started um, really early on in my journey when I was like 22 being told, oh, it's just it's just IBS, you know, don't worry about it. Um, And it just increasingly was like that. Um, By the time that I was very, very ill and had returned home from Africa to kind of like full time make my job seeking healthcare and trying to figure out what was wrong. um, You know, at one point, doctors thought, oh, it might be MS, multiple sclerosis, which is another autoimmune disease. And they did a bunch of tests for that. And then one doctor said, oh, I think it might be lymphoma. And I went through this whole process, you know, and of course, my husband and I were just completely panicked, um, thinking that that might be wrong. And then and and a lot of doctors dismissing me and saying, oh, um, you must have depression, or you're a very anxious uh, person, you just need an anxiety medication. Um, One doctor told me that um, I just had an anxiety disorder and that I should take Xanax. And then when the Xanax didn't work, he told me I should take Clonopin, which is an even stronger anti-anxiety medication. And he told me in the meantime, you can eat anything you want. Your diet doesn't matter. Eat, you should eat pizza, pasta, ice cream, because I, you know, when celiac disease gets really advanced, you have a lot of weight loss. And I was extremely, extremely underweight and malnourished by that point. And he thought I needed to eat more. So he was like, he told me to try to eat 3000 calories a day. Um, and 
you know, all, all of that was so kind of sad and depressing. And then at one point, some doctors took my husband aside and asked my husband if I was a very neurotic person, <laughs> um, you know, insinuated to him that his wife was not very stable. Um, and then finally, I was referred to a psychologist and she felt that my experiences living in West Africa, which is a challenging environment to live in, but I don't think I had trauma from that environment, but she felt that I had PTSD from that environment and diagnosed me with that. Luckily, right after that, I had a referral to a gastroenterologist who recognized the signs of celiac disease. And I finally got my celiac diagnosis. Wow. Um, I know there has to be a lot of healthy anger that you felt. <laughs> <laughs> and I that said is that. Nice, kinda, that is a nice right. way to put it, Jill. <laughs> because I know you probably wanted to punch a few of those doctors in the face, right? And then absolutely. And that's what I, that's what I mean with you know knowing that there's something wrong, and the doctor's just saying this is what I know, and if it's not within those parameters, then you know maybe you're crazy. Yeah. Or even pulling your husband aside and telling him, you know. Oof, that just that got me upset just thinking about it. Oh yeah, my husband was was pretty enraged. By that point, he was like, "Oh yeah, they're not listening to you." <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um. So I wanted to quote something that you said. You said, "I I had started developing sensitivities to other foods with anaphylactic like reactions. I had chronic digestive pain, and my belly was descending almost constantly. The underlying cause to that was." Yeah, I, I mean, it's uh, it's untreated celiac disease. So um, one thing that's really important to understand about our immune systems is that about 80% of the immune system is kind of lining the other side of our gut wall. So if you think about your intestine being like a long tube on the outside of the tube is most of our immune system. And the way that that tube, the intestine should work is that it has these really tightly interlocking cells. And they can open just a little to allow some of the nutrients and other things to pass through. And, and our body, our immune system on the other side will recognize those things as safe, good things to allow to pass through. But as your uh, intestine gets more and more damaged, this especially happens with, um, you know, digestive gastrointense intestinal autoimmune diseases like celiac, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis. But it happens in autoimmune disease in general. Most autoimmune diseases have in common that the gut is leaking. So the, these tight interlocking cells have opened up too wide. And now particles can get through, food proteins can get through that should not be getting through, at, at least in that size. And on the other side, the immune system is going, uh-oh, this is an invader, and starts mounting a response. And those those symptoms of food sensitivity, allergic reaction, um, anaphylaxis style reactions are, are your immune system trying to, to, trying to defend you. Your immune system thinks this is danger. Um, and, you know, for me, that culminated in a couple of events where I had to go to the ER and, um, finally we were assigned a nurse practitioner. I was given, you know, um, injectable uh, drugs to help with anaphylaxis. And we were assigned a nurse practitioner who showed my daughter how to practice giving me the injection in case I would have full on anaphylaxis in front of her. And ooh, honestly, this makes me a little bit emotional. That was a, that was a major turning point for me because I did not want my 12 year old to be responsible for saving my life if it got that bad. Of course. Yeah. So I that, mean, that's a a lot of both that, of yeah. yeah, that really motivated me to make some major changes and advocate for myself in a new way. I'm glad you did because that turned into a whole community of people being advocated for through your work. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the autoimmune protocol. Oh, also, the, the reason why I wanted to quote you on that last uh, comment was because if somebody's listening and if they have similar symptoms and they're frustrated with doctors not listening, you know, this is a tool for you to say, okay, 
this sounds like something that I'm dealing with and maybe this could help me. Yeah. So that was the reason why I wanted to drive that point home. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So what is the autoimmune protocol and what did it do for you? So I'll give you the elevator speech for the autoimmune protocol. So uh, the autoimmune protocol, it's also known, some people might have been introduced to it as autoimmune paleo or the paleo approach or AIP. It's a science-based elimination and reintroduction diet and lifestyle protocol. So it focuses on repairing gut health, you know, that leaky gut we were just talking about, balancing hormones and regulating the immune system. The dietary component removes food-driven sources of inflammation and restores nutrient density. And the lifestyle component includes approaches to sleep, stress management, movement, and connection. And that connection encompasses both humans and nature in order to help us best manage autoimmune disease. Um, it's been used successfully alone and in combination with conventional autoimmune disease treatments. And depending on a person's needs, um, you know, you can kind of tweak that template. And it's also been the focus of medical research. Um, and for me, it, it changed my life. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it was funny because when we first started talking, we were discussing some of your community activism. And then I think maybe I was going through your content and I was like, wait, she's uh, part of the autoimmune protocol. And then I was like, <laughs> she, she was actually one of the founders. And I was like, oh my goodness. And you were like, yeah, you know, um, a lot of people don't realize that. And I was like, well, I want to take this episode to put some respect on your name. <laughs> <laughs> well, th thanks, Shalana. I, I, to me, um, the work is the more important piece and whether or not it's helping folks out in the autoimmune community is what's important. Whether or not um, I, I get to be the face of it is not important to me. <laughs> That's cool. And the, the humility that you have associated with it is even more so a reason I believe why you're such a, a a voice for us all, because it's not about you. It's about what we can derive from the things that you're doing. Um, yeah. Okay. So what was your contribution to the autoimmune protocol? Um, so my partner, uh, Mickey Truscott and I, um, you know, we ha we partnered early on at autoimmune wellness and, and kept that partnership going for seven plus years. Um, and we, we focused primarily on the practical implementation of AIP. So we are good friends with Dr. Sarah Ballantyne. I don't know if she's been on your show yet, but you should reach out to her, Jalan. Um, Dr. Sarah Valentine, she has a PhD in, in uh, biomedical research. And so she she was the one who was kind of refining the science about the autoimmune protocol. And Mickey and I being um, coaches and nutritional therapists, we focused on helping people actually implement the protocol and, and do things like develop recipes and everything so people could cook, you know, adjust their their cooking and their kitchen skills to to use using the protocol. Um, over time, um, I developed a, a group coaching program that used a phased elimination process. So rather than cold turkey one day, just cut out a long list of foods um, and try to add a bunch of nutrient dense foods and work on the lifestyle components, I, um, you know, kind of pioneered a program where you slowly eliminated food. Um, starting with the foods that are the most likely to be causing a reaction for folks with autoimmune disease and finishing with foods that are least likely to be causing a reaction. And then also phased in nutrient density, a mistake that people make very often when they ad adopt the um, autoimmune protocol is focus on all the foods they need to cut out, but they don't add back foods to bring in nutrition and kind of flood the body with all the nourishment it needs to, to promote healing. Um, and then just slowly work on the lifestyle component too. I think, um, when people start the autoimmune protocol, they feel really intimidated by the dietary changes. Um, but anybody who has done it long-term knows that the lifestyle aspects really working on your sleep, your stress management, really, you know, focusing on connection with your, your human, you know, supporters and loves and, in nature, that stuff actually is really the meat of it that takes a lot more work. So 
I pioneered a program that that helped people do that gradually um, instead of all at once, a kind of slow and steady transition. And eventually um, I used that program in partnership with doctors and microbiome researchers to kind of further the, the research basis um, underlying the autoimmune protocol and prove that AIP does have efficacy. Okay, so let's say that, for instance, someone is out there searching for something different mm -hmm. and um, they hear this episode or they find you online and they go, yeah, you know, I've tried all these other diets. This is probably just another one, right? What is it that makes the autoimmune protocol different and not just any other diet? I mean, I think that the big thing is that AIP is not a diet that's about weight loss. It's not um, a diet that's about health optimization for folks who are already robustly healthy. It's it's not about an aesthetic goal. Um, and it's also not just dietarily focused. It's a tool for autoimmune management that addresses both the nutrition and the lifestyle, and it can be adjusted for each individual in a template style, kind of like in the same way that you might have like a template that you use when you reach out to your podcast guests. Um, AIP is like that, but it, there are portions of it that an individual can tweak to kind of fit their situation and their needs. Um, it's, it's a, it's a tool. It's not, it's not about some kind of outside goal. Okay. So then how would someone know if it's a good fit for them? I think that um, any anyone with autoimmune disease could consider it a great potential tool for them to try out. Um, it's not, it's the, the great thing about something like AIP, unlike some of the, you know, um, biologic drugs and everything, there's not any really adverse side effects. The, the worst thing that's going to happen is that you eat a bunch of nourishing food and, and you don't, you know, drink coffee for a month or something, right? Like it's not, it's not really harmful to you. It's worth the experiment. Um, I think it's especially a, a great thing to give a shot to if you have kind of gone as far as you can go with conventional treatments for your autoimmune disease. If you feel like, gosh, I've, I've taken the medication the doctor told me to do, or I've made the other changes that the doctor told me to make, and I'm, I'm just still not getting the quality of life that I'd like to experience, I think that person is a really good candidate for um, throwing the AIP into their toolbox because we've seen in the research studies that I helped you know, um, lead that when you combine that conventional with the diet and lifestyle, it's really powerful and can go a lot further. It can take quality of life a lot higher for folks with autoimmune disease. I'd say that AIP is, is not a great tool for anyone who has an active eating disorder um, or anyone who has struggled with disordered eating in the past and doesn't have strong therapeutic support while they go through the process. Um, you know, any dietary template um, that, that involves food restriction, even if it's temporary like it is with the autoimmune protocol, um, can be too triggering. And the point here is to heal and unburden your heart and mind from the, the poor health you're experiencing. You don't want to add to that if you're, if you're kind of dealing with the challenge of eating disorders. Hmm. That was a great answer. And I think that you pretty much summed up the entire AIP protocol, what it is, who it's good for, um, how it can benefit somebody, what the symptoms are, all the things. Um, and you can tell that you're passionate about it and that you know what you're talking about. Um, so I think, I think we did put that little, you know, dot on your name let, <laughs> to let everybody know who you are. <laughs> Thanks, Shalon. So you, you stepped away from the wellness space. Um, why was that and was it difficult? Yeah. So, um, I stepped away in part due to burnout, if I'm just really, really honest with your audience, um, you know, 
I think you, you, you see it all the time on social media, Jalan. I don't do anything without a high degree of passion. <laughs> true. Um, I, I really bring a lot of energy and a lot of heart to the work that I do at any given time. And especially if you are working, um, on a concept or in a field that's kind of new and, and a cutting edge approach, um, it can be really risky to to kind of head out into burnout territory because you're you're constantly having to advocate for this new idea and this new concept. Um, you're constantly having to well, first of all, you have to create the language to describe it, but then you have to advocate for use of that language. Um, and you know. The world is full of skeptics and haters and you you're kind of always trying to prove actually there's something here um and not only that but as a health coach and nutritional therapist you know i worked with um over a hundred individual clients in in my time and over 2500 people went through my group coaching program so you know, you're also extending lots and lots of compassion for people like myself who have been through a really, really harrowing and traumatizing, um, you know, health journey. So o over time, that can be kind of hard too. Um, so it was partly about that. Um, that was part of what kind of motiv motivated me to step away from that work. But it was also um, that the longer I did the work, the more clearly I saw that much of what's making all of us autoimmune disease or not all of us unhealthy and unwell, we can't really address it through just individual actions. We need kind of a course correction, I think, in our world from like this overemphasis, um, like self care and more toward community care, especially when I was coaching the group program, I could see community is a really powerful form of medicine. And I wanted to focus on others, um, like helping others make that connection, helping them find the language to have those conversations with their friends and family, and like finding a way to kind of sustainably engage in community level change processes. So, um, you know, it, it made me a deep believer in kind of the concept of holism that like everything and everyone is connected and we're not strong enough to kind of pull those really big levers that drive health and well-being on our own. But in a community, we can easily do that. And I mean, the examples that community care is powerful um, are so clear in places like the blue zone. So if your audience doesn't know about that, the blue zones are places around the world where people live to be really old but they're healthy and well um, as they age. Um, you can think of places like the Mediterranean, um, Okinawa, Japan. And one big thing that all those places have in common is really deep community connection and community care. And I thought, I want people to understand how powerful this is. And, you know, that this, this is like an uphill job in the United States of America. We are an individualist country. So <laughs> trying to, trying to get this message out is kind of a big one. Um, as far as was it hard to step away? I mean, very. I, I, I still care very much about the autoimmune community and the work, um, on the autoimmune protocol. And I personally am a person with autoimmune disease. So it matters to me on that level. Um, you know, I spent four years wrestling with the decision, um, to do it. Mm. So for you now, community care and activism, what does that mean to you? And how do you do it in real time? Um, so I, you know, my definition for community care comes from Nikita Valerio. So she was the woman who coined the term community care. And um, she says community care is the recognition of the undeniable cooperative and social nature of human beings and involves a commitment to reduce harm simply through being together. So if you think about Valerio's, Nikita Valerio's definition there in real time, it looks like things as simple as preparing and eating a meal with your friends and taking the time and space to connect with them and provide a buffer from the pressures of daily life in our world. Um, 
it could mean things like speaking about speaking out about social justice issues that are harming folks and um, contributing to to poor health and and you know being unwell. Um, kind of, there's a whole breadth in there, you know. Okay, so another way that you have, I guess, stepped your game up a bit in this community care is notes from a neighbor. Mm -hmm. What is that? And can you talk about it a little bit? Yeah, notes from a neighbor is where I write now, um, it's on Substack, about the community care concept. Um, I'm just kind of really working on forming a connected virtual neighborhood where we can have like really honest, really wide lens conversations on really hard subjects. So um, things like racism, environmental destruction, um, the collapse of our communities, uh, you know, topics like that. Um, I think community, just like food, I spent 10 years proving food is medicine, right? I think community is also a form of medicine and I'm advocating there for slow, small, simple approaches to delivering that medicine. Yes, sir. Um, okay, so the wellness space got you back to health and nourished your body. In what way has the transition from wellness to community activism provided nourishment for you? Um, I think that when we care for our communities, it's ultimately good for us. The, the idea that community care is self-care. So Bell Hooks, a really important uh, Black female activist, you know, she said, um, healing, rarely does healing occur in isolation. Um, healing is an act of communion, is a communal act. And, you know, six months ago, when I transi transitioned to kind of doing this community care activism full time and writing it notes from, from a neighbor, I thought, I'm going to I'm going to test this hypothesis. I'm very burnt out right now. I'm in need of a different kind of healing. And I'm going to see if spending all my time focusing on supporting others, focusing on speaking out about the topics that are harming my community, um, taking a lot of time to connect with the people I love and really putting human connection at the top of my list. I'm going to see if all that community care really is self-care. And six months later, I would say that Bell Hooks was right. <laughs> and that it has been very nourishing to me. I, I don't, you know, I'm not magically cured of burnout, um, but it has definitely moved the needle in a really noticeable way. I have seen the transition in your page on Instagram. And I love the way you advocate for those who don't have a voice. My God, I think that was one of the first times I reached out to you because I saw one of your posts and I was just like, thank you. <laughs> it affected me so deeply and it, it felt like someone was there to say, here's my hand if you need it, I can help you. And, and I just remember how strong I felt about that post. And then, like I said, come to find out, you know, you're an autoimmune warrior. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I love what you do. I'm so happy to have you as a guest on my show. Um, and I'm, I was also happy that you featured me on Notes from a Neighbor as well. Yes. Thank you um, for telling your story. Thank you for giving me a platform to do it. I think that, um, you know, I've, I, I started out talking about this stuff probably like about seven or eight years ago, and I just got louder and louder and louder. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, you see it, you see it, Jalan. I, I it's it's important to me, and I think that um, platform is a form of privilege, and I really want to be somebody who spends my privilege wisely, and I want to use it to you know lift up these things that I see harming my community, the people around me. You are, in fact, doing that. So thank you. <laughs> if someone wanted to um, find you online, like your um, social media or your other platforms, where could they? Um, they can find notes for uh, notes from a neighbor on Substack at angiealt.substack.com. 
and they can find me on Instagram at Angie.alt. And um, I don't really use the other social medias very much. I'm turning into an old lady now. My, <laughs> my daughter thinks I'm geriatric, but I'm like, I'm not, I'm not TikToking. <laughs> I'm not tweeting. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing all that stuff. They can find me on Instagram though. <laughs> So the last question I want to ask you is if you could use your platform to encourage anyone who may be struggling with their health or using their voice for change, what would you say? Uh, in, in both cases, I would say trust your intuition. I mean, I think it's really hard to hear our internal voice in this like very noisy world that we live in. But if you feel that there's something deeper wrong in your personal health struggle, keep pushing because you are the expert on your body. Um, doctors have their area of expertise, but you're living in your body every single day and nothing can replace that knowledge that you have about yourself. Um, if you think something's wrong, you're likely right. Um, and the same applies, I think, with being a voice for change. If you feel that something is wrong in our world, if you feel that there's something harming your community, um, speak up because other people probably feel it too. And you, your voice might be the voice that makes them brave enough to say, yeah, I feel that too. I'm worried about that too. I love that. Um, this was wonderful. I, um, I feel completely nourished in everything that you said about the community, the work that you're doing the advice that you gave on how to speak up and how to be a part. Um, I'm just really glad that we were able to do this. I know it took some time, but we got it. Yeah. Thanks so much for, um, for in asking me to be on and just um, for connecting and, and yeah, and being patient with me about getting this scheduled. We did it. <laughs> <laughs> we sure did. All right, Angie. So I want to say thank you again for this, for your time for agreeing to do this with me, for who you are, for what you do and the way you do it. Ah, thank you so much, Jalan. The same to you.